Coming up on the program, we're going to talk about raised beds, materials, placement, and what you should and shouldn't do, as well as talking about lost vegetables, plants that you may or should consider growing in your garden this year. An interview with actress and urban organic gardener Kate Cottrell. All that more coming up today. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast is permeating into your ears with your host, Joey Beck. And it could be the weeds. Some gardeners try to get all the weeds out of their garden. Other gardeners leave them in their garden. It's really a decision that you need to make. There's benefits to both sides of that. It's just something that you need to figure out what you want to do for your garden. And holly bird. Canning is a science. When you're canning, you want to make sure you follow the directions, follow the recipe, don't cut corners, don't replace things. It's crucial to you, your health, and your family. They're professional gardeners with full-time jobs. And they're on the air now. Welcome, friends, to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast, a podcast for the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide. I am your host, Joy Baird. Alongside is my wife, best friend, and co-host, Holly Baird. This program is for the advanced gardener, the beginner gardener, the average gardener. We help you go through your growing season so you can be a better gardener. Behind the TWVG microphone here at the WI Garden Media Studios here in southeast Wisconsin, the information that you're going to hear is important. You just may have to tweak some of the dates and times that you apply to your growing conditions. If you are tuning in, you're wanting to know how to grow vegetables or you're wanting to know how to do it better. And you probably know who we are, but if you don't, we'll briefly give you a little description and about what we do. Every week we have a couple different video productions that are high quality, high definition where we take you into the garden or into our home where you can become a better gardener. We also do a quarterly digital magazine that can be found on the website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. It is free for it downloadable. You can also print that out. You can also read it online. And all the stories you see in it, we have uh, five or six issues now up on the website. They were all produced in-house. Holly and I both uh, would take topics and write stories. So it's another avenue for you to acquire more gardening material. And if you ever have any question or want to contact us, please feel free to visit our website at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com where there's a red contact us button. Easy for you to find and ask any question you may have. Also, you can go to the podcast tab and see the previous podcasts that are in this series. Another avenue for more information. You can check out the sponsors that support this podcast, believing in the same gardening beliefs as we do, and we'll talk more about them throughout the broadcast. We're going to talk about raised beds, and there's a number of reasons why people may want to choose the raised bed route for growing vegetables. One reason may be because you may have questionable soil, and it may be easier for you to build a raised bed, bring in your own soil, or maybe you have clay soil, you know, dirty soil. You, you don't know. So maybe it's easier for you. Also, if you have any sort of disability or movement trouble or anything like that, you may want to make taller raised beds so you can still have a garden but have easier access to them. There's a number of different ways you can go about making a raised bed, uh, dimensions and sizes. The general rule of thumb that we like to direct you in is a raised bed. You can make it as long as you choose to make it, but we advise no more than four foot wide. Right. You want to be able to reach across it. So you can make it as long as you want, but four feet feet wide means you can reach into it two feet on either side. Now let's talk about the materials that one can choose to construct a raised bed with. There's There's a variety of different things, and we're not going to be able to cover all of them that are in the world, but we're going to hammer out a few of them here that's probably the most common. Well, obviously, there's different types of lumber. And what kind of lumber do we want to use, Joey? Non-treated lumber. You uh, will see the, uh, if you're familiar with lumber industry, you'll see the term treated lumber. And they've taken some of the chemicals out of that. And it's more of a copper-based treatment uh, based on who you look at. But that really is still not the most uh, healthiest way. You can use cedar, which uh, is a very, uh, takes a very long time for cedar to rot. Or you can go the more traditional route and just get the 2x6, 2x8, 2x12 lumber at, that's untreated. That's the, the white looking wood and construct your raised bed out of it. Now we're going to bring up one of the sponsors of the program, not because we favor them more than the others, but it, it ties into the topic that we're talking about, and that's preserving the raised bed material. Right. So 
There's a product called Timber UV Coatings, Timber Pro UV Coatings. At TimberPro.com. You can right. find that on the website under the podcast tab and in the show notes for this program. And it's a non-toxic coating. It doesn't contain any harmful chemicals, any uh, PV, PVAs or PVBs or anything like that that has traceable chemicals that may end up in leaching into your garden. Now, it it, uh, it works, it absorbs from the inside and basically preserves the wood in the simplest terms. You can also use this on your decks, on your chicken coops, whatever uh, natural wood surfaces you have. But that's one way and you want to coat all open uh, sides, whether you cut a board down, you want to coat all six types, tops, bottoms, front, backs, and ends. But that's one way to go about uh, creating a raised bed, one material you can use to preserve that raised bed material to prolong it because, you know, buying lumber is not cheap here. But if you want a very nice a sti- a nice looking raised bed and to make it last, this way be a, a way of going. Now, how deep do we really want a raised bed? I mean, you spoke about if you have mobility issues, you, want, you can jack it up a little higher. But really, what, 10 inches is about... about 10, the, 10 to 12 inches. 10 to 12 inches is about the max. Because you're really your root crops, which uh, we'll, we're probably going to talk a little bit about in the second segment of the program. Some of your longer root crops, your carrots and your parsnips, are, are probably going to penetrate a little bit longer. But for the general average vegetable, they're going to take and grow about the first 6 to 8 inches of soil. It's also a good idea to set up some sort of weed barrier. So if you have some old cardboard, maybe you have some old cardboard boxes, you just want to lay those flat down. Before you put your soil over. If you have problems with gophers uh, burrowing into your, or you notice them in your yard, you'll want to put what they call gopher wire. It's just a very heavily gauged uh, poultry, basically like, it's like chicken wire, but very, very thick metal. You put that underneath the raised bed before you fill it, uh, and there's instructions on it on how to do that. But it keeps the, the woodchucks and the gophers from burrowing up and r- destroying your raised bed. Now, other materials that you can use to make your raised bed, you can simply go out and find some logs and cut them down to the dimensions or the lengths and the width that you want. That's more of a a rustic uh, homesteading type of look. You Uh, could also use uh, straw bales, hay bales. A lot of people will do that to to make a a raised bed shape, fill it in with the topsoil, and if you've got a lot of them, you know, you could use that. And you can also grow in them uh, or... Uh, la- a previous episode, we talked to Joel Karsten about his book and how to grow in, in straw bale gardening. So if you want to know more about that, you can check that out. Uh, the link is in the uh, on the website there. Now, it just came out recently that cedar or uh, uh, cinder block gardening may not be the best because there's uh, some kind of a chemical or a problem with the cinder blocks that can leach into the soil. So that's something if you're if you're looking into that way, you might want to do some research. Uh, and make an educated decision for your own uh, growing situation. We're not telling you you can't. We're just telling you here's what may be out there. So take a look at it. Uh, we can use pop-up raised beds. is another uh, cheap and uh, inexpensive way in some cases. But sometimes... This the- is good for if you have a patio or a deck and you don't have a backyard where you can put a raised bed. You just fill it with the soil. When you're done, you can just dump that soil out. Rinse it off, fold it up, put it back for next year. Yeah, and there's a, a the variety of different sizes out there, and you can you you know you can find whichever matches your uh, growing capabilities or situation. Uh, dresser drawers. Now this was an oldie but a goodie, but there, you just can't use any old dresser drawer. No, you want to make sure that it's not been on the inside. Generally, they're not been treated. As well as the material that the the uh, dresser drawer is made out of. There is what is called a particle board, which is the uh, basically what it is is they mix glue and sawdust together and press it and clamp it together to make it into a piece of wood. And when those, it's like what you buy uh, your, when you go to the store now and you buy bookshelves or TV stands. It, it, when it gets wet, it expands like a sponge, and whatever chemical that glue was inside of it, it's going to leach out. Now, different people will tell you, and again, this is. Giving it out, putting the information out there for you to be educated so you can do your own research to figure out what you feel is good for your family or not. That certain vegetables will not pick up any leaching that's in the soil. If it's a root crop, it has the potential of picking leaching the chemicals up in the soil. If it's a a tomato or a pepper or eggplant, the chances of that chemical or the the, uh, substance in the soil being in the actual edible fruit is slim to none. So that's just something you want to keep aware of depending on how uh, you look at it. Right, and these are all things you have to consider when you decide that you want to 
go ahead and, you know, build raised beds, what route you want to take, how much you want to invest in it, how long you may have it there, the reasons why you have it there, and also uh, how much space you're going to need for it. So if you want to do a nice untreated lumber and treat it with the the Timber Pro, Pro, you know, that's going to last you a little bit longer than if you just do some old logs, perhaps. Well, let's talk about, regardless of what design, shape, style, material you use, let's talk about two more things. Placement, and you got to call somebody before, you don't have to, but it's recommended. So let's talk about placement of the raised bed in on your property here. Sure. So um, I guess we should go with what you do before you decide where you're going to place it. You should, you should call Digger's Hotline. Even though you're not digging... Say that you find out that there's a major pipeline or something going underneath where you're going to put your raised bed. Now, if the city or the county or municipalities have to come in and work on that... They don't care if you've got a raised bed there or not. They will destroy it to get the uh, utility dug up and repaired. They don't care if you've got tomatoes or peppers or, or, or a world record pumpkin there. They're going to dig it up because that's their job and that's the end of the story there. That's, that will help you make the best decision as to where you're going to put it. And also, maybe that will help you make a decision as to how many you're going to put and how big they're going to be. So what's the, what's the guidelines for calling Digger's Hotline? Is there a you dr- want to call 72 business hours before you're going to dig. But this is a free service. Yes, it's a free service. And actually, and even if you're not going to dig, you want to call 72, allow 72 hours before you start building it. Um, but and and if the and this is just the law basically for anything. If you're putting in a fence post or a mailbox, you need to do this too. So so that's uh, that's an, and then once we've established that either we have no utilities or we can put our raised beds in areas where utilities are not currently in under them, then we're let's let's talk about placement of the raised bed. Sure. So you want to think about right now it's spring, so your trees and your brush and your bushes are not filled in. So you're going, you might go in your backyard and you're like, oh, it looks really sunny right here. But you want to think about how it's going to look when it's midday in the middle of July. Look up is if there's limbs there, there will be leaves there. Right. So that's some things to keep in consideration when it comes to constructing a raised bed. And you can have a raised bed even if you have traditional ground garden, a container garden. It can be in addition to your growing uh, a genre of uh, mediums in your back or front yard based on the municipality you live in. And it can be a great addition to your garden. Coming up next, we're going to talk about the lost vegetables that may not be in your vegetable garden. We'll be right back after this. Paradigm Garden, Wisconsin's largest progressive gardening center. Located in Madison, Wisconsin, Paradigm Gardens offers the largest selections of soil amendments, organic and salt-based plant nutrients, grow lights, and hydroponic systems available in the Midwest. Our knowledgeable and experienced sales staff are always available to help. Visit our new website, www.paradigmgardens.com, or visit our retail store at 4501 Helgeson Drive, Madison, Wisconsin, just off Stoughton Road. It's all about the soil at ManureTea.com. With their grass-fed, antibiotic, and growth hormone-free cattle and horses, owner Annie Haven puts the quality in her premium soil conditioner. 100% organic and natural, whether feeding your flowers or veggies, indoors or out, you can grow organically with confidence. To purchase authentic Haven brand Manure Tea, small orders or large, go to ManureTea.com. Always free shipping! Hi, this is Nikki Jabor, author of The Year-Round Vegetable Gardener and Groundbreaking Food Gardens, which you can find at NikkiJabor.com. And you're listening to Joey and Holly Baird on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast. You could also take a cold frame and turn it into a raised bed. I mean, the soil level would be a little different, but it's something to think about. Welcome back to the program. If you want to find more information about our sponsors, you can visit the podcast tab on our website, and you can link them there. You can also find it in the show notes for this program. Let's talk about the lost vegetables that uh, people may not be growing in their garden that's on the cover of uh, the side of a milk carton. For you younger listeners, ask your parents about that. You probably don't get that joke. So let's talk about some of these things that maybe the normal, ordinary, average backyard gardener is not considered growing because, one, maybe they that's not even on their, on their radar. Right. So there's the ones that are kind of the, the root vegetables 
um, which are things like parsnips. Well, let's talk about let's talk about each one of these as we sure. go. Parsnips. Okay. It's a it's a relatable to the carrot. It can be much more longer and and grow much deeper, and it's a white white root vegetable that has an, a nuttier flavor. Earthier. Earthier flavor. Yeah. And it has a much larger top growth on right. it. But if done right, these things can get uh, two or three, four inches in diameter and about 18 inches long. But also keep in mind, the longer you allow these things to grow, the tougher they can become. And now, with any of these, they require regular watering. Right. So, well, as with any vegetable. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, now, if you like carrots, you'll definitely like parsnips, I think, um... I know that you like carrots a lot more right. than I do, and you like the parsnips. And you can roast these parsnips. You can eat them raw. You can pickle. Or you can you can can them with pressure canning them uh, mm-hmm. in that instance. So that that's one thing. And now planting each one of these requires its own uh, set of uh, growing instructions because just because you plant carrots one way and you can't plant parsnips the same way because they're a little different in growing uh, habits. So we also have then since we're along the line there of carrots parsnips. The rainbow carrots. Rainbow carrots. Everybody grows the orange carrots, and that's fine and good. The orange carrots is not traditional. There's a story behind it. I don't remember. It has to do with a king uh, back in the, I think, 17 or 1800s, and they, they made the carrot orange because he liked the color. Anyway, the the color orange, the orange traditional carrots, just doesn't have the amount of nutrients that the, the rainbow carrots have, uh, just because you want to eat your vegetables of color. Now, rainbow carrots, and that's simply what it means. You've got purples, you've got reds, you've got whites, orange, orange, yellows, all the colors of the rainbow. And these can be planted as the same way as you would the traditional orange carrot. Again, with root root vegetables, the parsnips and the carrots, you want to have good tilth in your soil. If you have clay soil, you can, one, you can do these in raised beds, as we talked about in the first segment, or if you have very, very tough uh, uh, clay soil, you can incorporate sand and compost into those ra- into those beds to help amend the soil to allow these carrots to penetrate down better into the ground. Now, there's also some other ones that are not maybe as familiar. Now, you may grow all of these uh, as a gardener. You may go, well, these are not that that you know unfamiliar at all. So, you know, for the the, uh, this is our list, and I'm sure there's a, a billion one other vegetables out there that we've never heard of before that, you know, if we knew, we would grow ourselves. So let's talk about uh, another one. Let's talk about leeks. All right, so leeks are basically, they're very similar to onions, but instead of them bulbing out, they just grow straight down and get really wide. So they're about an inch about an inch or so in width, sometimes two inches, just depending You may have seen these at your grocery store. I know I've seen them at the grocery store, and you may not know exactly what they are, but they're just a more mild-tasting onion, and they're beautiful to grow. They're pretty easy to grow, and they add great flavor to anything. And it's the white bleached part is the edible portion of it, and when you look at it at the grocery store, about 75% of the plant is not there. Right. Because they're they're trying to show you off the good, clean, white roots. And, And they take... 100 and to 130 days to reach maturity based on your variety. And, and like Holly said, very easy to grow. We are able to grow them very, very easily each year. And we get them a little bit bigger than a broom handle in most, most times. And, and there's a number of different applications that you can use for, for preserving them as well. But they're very hardy too. Another one I like um, is the turnips and the rutabagas. To me, these are different. I never, I never grew these growing up, and I don't think we ever really ate them either. So um, I remember one time when I was in college, uh, the first time, my roommate's friend, my roommate's You, you mom, didn't fail college the first time. I didn't let's, fail, yeah, but when I got my uh, associate's yeah. degree. My roommate's mother gave her rutabaga, and we were like, what do we do with this? And she's like, oh, it's kind of like a potato. And I was like, this does not look like a potato. But, um, yeah, so <laughs> rutabagas are a little bit different. They're root crop, and they grow to about a baseball size. Rutabagas take 60 days to reach maturity. Yeah. We're going to talk about, uh, no, uh, rutabagas take 90 days, 90 days to reach maturity. Turnips take 60 days to reach maturity. But they both grow in the same habits where the root penetrates the soil and the bulb stays above the soil. Uh, for the most part, you know, about half the bulb will stay above the soil, uh, depending on your soil tilth. If you have very loose soil, the, the bulb will kind of stay under the under the soil. If you have really dense soil, the bulb, the bulb will try to penetrate above the soil. And either way, you've got purple top turnips, you've got purple top radishes, you've got white top uh, turnips, and there's a couple of different varieties of rutabagas out there. But they, uh, 
they both kind of grow similar, and yeah. they, but they have different tastes. Right. The rutabaga, I think, is more earthy. More earthy. More, uh, not, I don't want to say bland, but it does have similar taste to potato, as opposed to turnip has um, more of like a, a radish taste, maybe more sweeter. So that's two of them. That, now those you can grow, uh, let, let's say, uh, the leeks you can grow all through the summer here in the northern climates. Mm -hmm. uh, carrots, the, the, now the kind of going trend is grow them later on in the summer so you get them in uh, that late late uh, fall, early winter because they seem to grow better that way. Par so then we have... Parsnips um, are, are a summer crop. Uh, we have kohlrabi. Well, I wanted to get to the, the turnips and rutabagas. That, those are a cool weather crop. I don't oh, want yeah. people to try to grow them in the heat of the summer. It's not going to All work. Right, that's fine. Okay. Go, go ahead with yours. Okay. So I didn't know what kohlrabi was until I met Joey. I thought... I was like, a what? What is this? And um, it looks like a little alien plant. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that can, if done right, can be very, very large in growth. Yeah. And actually, I just saw this recipe for, instead of like a potato gratin, making a kohlrabi gratin, which would be better for you because they don't, they're don't they not as starchy as potatoes. Now, you eat the bulb. Now, this bulb grows above the ground, uh, baseball, softball size, based on the variety. You can get them. Uh, some, of the, some of the world records are, are that 20 to 30 pound, you know, the, the gigantic kohlrabi. They come in a couple of different colors that are available. Uh, you can cut them real thin. Uh, there's a number of different things you can do with them, as you spoke about with the recipe. Uh, storage, you can can them. I believe pressure canning is the yeah. on, only way you can go about on I that. I think so. I'm sure you could probably find a recipe to do like some refrigerator pickling. I'm not sure how that would taste. But, but it's something, if you don't, I've never heard of kohlrabi, at least look into it. Not saying you have to grow it, but look into what the health benefits are of these. And look into how to grow it. See if it is even capable of being grown in your growing area. Let's talk about another one here. Jerusalem artichokes. Jerusalem artichokes, for those of you who are, are, are not familiar with it, uh, this really became popular in the organic gardening world and really on YouTube about probably three years ago is when that really took off. Jerusalem artichokes, and, and you can explain what the Jerusalem artichoke is here. They're also called sunchokes, and what they are is they're actually a plant similar to sunflowers, but they grow roots in the ground. They grow these tubers, and they're kind of like a really like knotty, they, you gnarled. Would, if potato. you looked at them, you would think they were ginger. Right, they look. They, like they ginger. very similar yeah. resemble ginger, but they're not related to whatsoever. No. I'm just giving you a, 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 a mental image of what these I think roots look like. I think they're called sunchokes because the, they grow these beautiful flowers. That, kind of look like smaller sunflowers like mini sunflowers but anyway and the, the plants grow like 10 to 12 feet high so uh, and, and average to poor soil these things will grow yeah and but there's a catch to those they they come back year after year no matter what you do so dedicate a raised bed dedicate yeah. a certain portion of the garden for them because you're never going to get them out there a perennial that produces food that come back year after year like strawberries or asparagus or uh, raspberries blueberries so it's not necessarily a bad thing so they're a, they're kind of like a less starchy potato, almost like um, they're you know they got a little crunch to them. You can eat them raw. You can eat them cooked. You can make what we call choke browns, where you uh, make them. Into that sounds pizza. like a horrible term for that. Yeah. Choke browns. <laughs> well, they're good. Uh, some hash, hash browns, browns made from artichokes right. or sunchokes. Let's um, let's describe it that if way. If you roast them with like a roast or uh, in a stew, they get this like nice buttery flavor to them. Um, but they do, pardon us, they do give us gas. They give everybody gas. They now, have a, they have a, something in them causes a reaction with their body and it happens. Now, different people will say the longer you can leave these in, they take 100 to 100, 120 to 150 days of full sun of warm temperatures to reach maturity. And they, you will know when it's time for to harvest them uh, because they will start to die back. Now, you can harvest them at any time during the growing season. But different individuals will say to lessen the effect on your body from the artichoke causing your body to have gas, the longer you can leave them in the ground, the better off you are and the less less gas that will cause. Okay. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm well, just... We leave ours pretty long on the ground. Okay? Right. And, and you can harvest these as you need them, or if you're in the northern climates like we are, or, uh, that at some point during November, the winter hits and you don't know where the ground is because there's snow and ice and it's frozen, you can bring these in and harvest them early and layer them in a bucket mimicking the ground as well as we kept them in the stairs going to our attic. We want to layer them in a bucket with dirt. Dirt. Uh, we put them in an airtight bag and put them in the stairs along with the bucket. And they've kept very well. 
Right. They they typically they'll get very soft, but I think because we had them in the attic where we it had that ambient temperature of outdoors, it didn't allow them to uh, spoil as as quickly as maybe if you would put them in a refrigerator or or if you leave them out, you're, you're done in about two days. If you don't put them in soil or an airtight bag, yeah, they're not. Um, and you can you can do some. Um Lacto fermentation with them, some countertop brining, pickling with them. I've heard. I haven't tried it yet, but you can do that. And uh, you can uh, you can buy these from online sources, or you can also, depending on if you're near a health food store, some of them will carry Drew's and artichokes, and you can just buy them right off the shelf and put them in the ground, and they'll start sprouting like your traditional potatoes will. We'll cover one more item here that may not be a familiar item in your garden, which is celery. Right. So. Obviously, a lot of people eat celery. They add recipes. It's it's an ingredient in the French in the French aromatics mirepoix. So um, yeah, it's very popular, but many people don't grow it. And we grew we grew a whole bed of it. We grew it like nobody's business. Now it, it can grow. We grew it in partial shape. Right. It can grow much larger. Now it's go, not going to look like the celery that you buy at your grocery store from the big farmers out in the West. Right. But it has a much vibrant, much more vibrant taste, a much crisper pop to it. But you don't have those big, long, wide stalks that you normally would find in the store. So celery, that may be something you want to consider growing in your vegetable garden. But if you don't like celery, don't waste your time on trying to grow it. It can be a fidgety type of plant uh, based on your growing conditions. So that's just some of the lost vegetables maybe you should consider or look at or at least investigate. Maybe you should grow or try to grow in your vegetable garden. Stay tuned. Coming up after the break, actress and urban gardener, K. Cottrell. A gardener knows that the key to a good plant is its roots. With poor roots, the end result is not good. Conventional pots and trays cause roots to wrap around and become root-bound. Then you try to unwrap the roots at the time of planting, hoping not to break them. But never again with the Root Maker, a non-chemical innovation that naturally air prunes roots to create more vigorous roots. Never a root-bound plant again. Whether trees, flowers, or edibles, home garden or commercial grower, more roots means healthier, more productive plants. To get your own, visit RootMaker.com. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. It's Joey. And Holly Bear. Of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast, taking a moment to remind you that you can sign up for a weekly email so you don't miss anything that we do, our podcasts, our videos, our digital quarterly magazine. You won't miss anything by signing up. Just go onto our website on the right-hand side. There's a, a big button for you to press. Just go ahead and sign up right now. And you can also ask us questions underneath that big green button. There's a big red button. So sign up for our emails for free. No spam, and if you've got a question, you can send us that as well. WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide. Hey there, this is Hugh Richards from the YouTube channel Hughes Nursery, which teaches you how you can grow organic vegetables cheaply and easily at home. You're currently listening to Joey and Holly Baird on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the program. If you want to know more about the sponsor you've just heard, you can always visit our website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and click on the podcast tab. That'll have all their information. Check them out. They're supporting us with the same beliefs that we believe that you should have as gardeners. Let's go over to California. Let's be more specific. Let's go to Los Angeles, California, to speak with the creator of a garden, urban garden show that is, uh, was created in 2012, entitled Late Bloomer. Actress Kate Cottrell is the host of this show, and we are going to talk to her about some of the uh, challenges and rewards of having an urban, organic garden in the city. Welcome to the program, Kay. <laughs> Thank you, Joey. Thanks for having me. Well, let's talk about this. This you uh, in, in your video series, which is at the, um, latebloomershow.com, you talk about you grew up 
with a family that was gardeners and you got away from it. And this whole late bloomer gardening, urban organic garden started in the fall of 2008 when your parkway tree died. That's right, uh, Joey. What happened is, um, you know, I left uh, the small town for the big city and just got into bigger and bigger cities. Uh, I went from Washington, D.C. to New York City, and then I came to L.A. And I had never really uh, had an opportunity or been focused on trying to grow my own food. And um, I'd been a food activist for uh, a couple of decades, an environmentalist for probably 30 years, but I had never tried to really grow anything. And, uh, you know, we lived in apartments most of the time. And um, so when uh, this parkway tree, which is the strip between the sidewalk and the street in in, uh, Los Angeles, we refer to it as the parkway, uh, this could be two feet deep or six feet deep or eight feet deep. Um, But technically the city owns this. Um, But at you know, in 2012, most people are aware that uh, the city of Los Angeles was broke <laughs> and they cut back a lot of city services, um, but they still had restrictions. You, you, it was not uh, so-called legal to plant a food garden in the parkway. But my tree w- uh, that died was in the parkway, and um, when that happened, I tried to save the tree. It didn't happen. I tried various things. I was out there digging and carrying on. Uh, for a couple of months, and the tree finally died, and uh, I took it out, and I, I had occasion to meet a biodynamic farmer um, who's been in the area for decades. He's an older gentleman, and uh, he came by, and he said, from now on, you're only growing edibles, and it was just like I said, yes, sir, <laughs> and uh, I haven't looked back. Two citrus trees and surround them with herbs, and that's what I did in um, Really, it was probably the uh, December or January of uh, 2012, and within a month, I uh, was just out there digging and digging and trying to change this hard clay soil in the parkway to something that uh, a plant would grow in, and uh, my neighbors would go by and say, what are you doing? You know, and I kept saying, I'm a late bloomer. I'm a late bloomer. And uh, it just kind of stuck, and I thought, you know, maybe there's a, an audience out in the world that cares about food as much as I do who still has the energy and the interest in, in wanting to grow it. And so that's why I created uh, Late Bloomer, and that's what I'm still trying to do. I'm still trying to learn to be a better gardener and, and hopefully uh, inspiring people to do the same thing along the way. Absolutely. We all are learning every every time we go in the garden. Now, with this creation of the Late Bloomer at LateBloomerShow.com, which will be in the show notes for this episode, what kind of responses have you got from your viewers as you document your challenges in your organic urban garden? Well, I've gotten the, the kind of responses, uh, you know, not as many responses, but maybe, you know, <laughs> being on your show will help me with that. Um, but uh the kind of responses I'm getting are just what I would have wanted. They said, you've inspired me to go out and grow heirloom tomatoes. I mean, I got that the other day after I posted my heirloom tomato epic. And uh, several people said, oh, I want to either try that variety or you've inspired me to go out and, and, and grow something of my own. Or That's, that's mostly what, uh, what really gets me excited is when people say, you've inspired me to action. It's like your payment for for working hard to produce the program. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As as our listeners will go over to latebloomershow.com dot com to, to view your videos. As, as we spoke about your, your parkway, it's the the piece of ground between the the road and the sidewalk. Now it it it's encouraging to me to see this in a front yard, as we see many cities uh, suing homeowners for trying to grow in the front yard or even on city property. But you have a group of neighbors that are, are seem to be very encouraged by this. They come over, they talk to you, they, they help you, they give you suggestions and tips on how to, how to grow better. Mm-hmm. Well, um, most of my neighbors in my neighborhood, you know, they're, they're a handful of, of older folks who have helped me, who, uh, did have a garden or do have a garden, but not too many people are growing food, and I'm really trying to encourage that with my neighbors. Um, but yes, 
And up until last year, uh, when they changed the, we got some new council persons in in the city of Los Angeles, and um, we we managed to to get the. It was a four hundred dollar, excuse me, four hundred dollar violation uh, to grow a food garden in the parkway in front of your house. Uh, if you got caught and if people complained, I mean, the city is not going to patrol and and bust people that were doing it. Uh, because they don't have the resources, but if, you know, if a neighborhood complained, and this is what happened to Ron Finley. I don't know if you're aware of Ron Finley, but he's he's uh, very well known now. He turned a 50-foot strip of parkway in his southeast, south-central Los Angeles uh, neighborhood into a food garden any, that anyone was welcome to take whatever from, and yet he, he got complaints. And he went to his city council person. No, first of all, he did an online petition, and he got 200,000 signatures uh, backing him. And he went to his city councilman, and his city councilman went to the city council, and they got those restrictions um, halted, and and now they're rewriting the laws. So it's really an exciting time uh, for people, some people in who live in cities, that's the only piece of ground they have, you know, because there's so much asphalt and so much concrete. And um, I am witness to the fact that you can turn a very inhospitable, hard clay soil into something fertile if you work Absolutely. on it. Absolutely. Now, as gardeners, we all learn from our mistakes, or, or nature teaches us what mistakes we've done. What are some of the biggest uh, mistakes that you've made in the last couple of years that you've documented on on your program to encourage people, hey, I did this wrong, so you don't have to. Right. Well, uh, first I want to uh, uh, mention that the biodynamic farmer, Farmer Jack, uh, uh, this, I interviewed him on an early episode because he has this three-minute foolproof planting lettuce technique, which I have as one of my videos, and I went and you know filmed this, and he told me, he said, when you're a gardener, there are more, there are no mistakes. And I really took that to heart because, you know, if you, and I'm sure you agree with me, Joey, because every time you go out, if you go, oh, okay, well, that didn't work, but look what I've learned from this experience. Exactly. And, um, I mean, there are, there are problems that give even serious, serious, you know, uh, long-time uh, experienced master gardeners pause, and that are, you know, aphids and mildew. I mean, Everybody experiences this, and it's challenging. And we're all looking for ways to, uh, organic ways to, uh, to deal with these things. But um, in terms of mistakes, uh, the very first big mistake I made, I planted corn without reading anything about how to grow corn. And, and uh, I, document, I document this in one of my early corn uh, episodes, is, you know, I put two or three, I thought, well, this will be pretty. I'll put two or three uh, uh, plants over here and two or three plants over there. I, I was not planting seed. My, my seed didn't come up. So I went to, and bought nursery plants because I was determined in my first garden to have corn. I love corn. And, you know, I separated these uh, plants and... Uh, Corn needs to be planted in a block of 16. Uh, 16 is recommended for a, for a, a garden, a, uh, for a yard garden, uh, just for pollination. You know, I didn't realize that it's only wind or rain that pollinates, and if you don't have all these stalks standing like little soldiers together, the, the corn won't get pollinated, and you'll have, you know, some of my cobs had like, 20 kernels, <laughs> 20 kernels on them. And, and I learned from that. And the next year I had corn cobs with 100% uh, kernels. In other words, you know, every silk, this is something I learned after I planted corn, is that every silk on a corn cob must be pollinated by pollen that drops down. And it's got to be dropped down by wind or rain. So, I just thought I just found that to be the most amazing thing, but it was such a great learning process. That mistake that I made that um, 
I'll never forget it. Absolutely. Now, you, you spoke about you're an organic gardener. Whenever this all started, was there ever another option for you? Did you ever think, well, I'll just use uh, inorganic uh, or synthetic fertilizer? Or was organic the first and only option you had for yourself in your garden? Yeah, it was the first and only because I had been have been an environmentalist for decades and I have used uh, the seventh generation philosophy. You know, that's the name of a company, seventh generation, but it's also a philosophy um, from the native peoples is, you know, the decisions that you make, you have to think of for the next seven generations. And if you think that way, there's no way you're going to put uh, anything toxic on your garden. And, and, and also, when you live in a city, you know, maybe when you're out in the country and you're not under any flight paths, you know, air, air flight paths or anything like that, you have much cleaner air. But in the city, uh, even if you're in a nice neighborhood, you are under some kind of a flight path. So we've got that coming down out of the sky, you know, and, um, and, and we're dealing with city water and how do you deal with that? And, you know, there's a lot of issues, a uh, toxic toxicity issues that you have to deal with in a city. Uh, so my feeling is for, for everything that I can control, I want to make sure it's 100% good for the plant, good for the soil, and good for me. Uh, in your videos, you document a, a problem. I, I don't know if it's really a problem, but uh, most gardeners don't experience. You have parrots that like to come in and, and feed off your sunflowers and, and other vegetation in your garden. <laughs> Well, uh, this is a unique situation. I don't think a, a, a lot of home gardeners need to worry too much about wild parrots <laughs> because, um, you know, they don't exist in that many places, but they love sunflower seeds. So uh, there is a myth. Uh, I, I don't know if it's really true, but that's what they say. When I first moved here 20 years ago, they said there was a... a um, pet store that burned in Santa Monica many years ago and these, these I guess it was a mating pair or something of parents um, got out and yeah. now there's about 70 or 80 birds that are in this um, uh, flock of uh, parrots that live in the canyons near here and every day they patrol they go over and they're very noisy <laughs> if you've watched the videos you've heard how noisy they are yeah. and they really decimated the parrots uh, excuse me, the sunflowers. But mm. this year I grew Mexican, well, I've been growing Mexican sunflower, but I, I only grew Mexican sunflower this year. And in my most recent episode, I talk about, you know, one of the one of the reasons that I do this is because the stems are uh, more fragile and they can't support parrots. So the parrots don't come down and bother them. <laughs> And, and and they're good uh, for deer repellent. Deers don't like eating them, as as what you were explaining in your video. Yeah, there. yeah. I mean, I I haven't had any problems, and deer do go down the street. If you can believe, deer go down our street in in a city in Los Angeles. It depends on how close you are to one of the canyons, and um, and we have other wildlife. There's a you know, I just had a raccoon problem. I didn't have um, I didn't make a video, but I have a couple of blog posts about it. Um, and it's interesting. They don't touch the vegetables. They don't even mess with the compost. What they're interested in are the big, fat June bug grubs that are right under the soil. And, you know, they'll dig anywhere they feel like digging. So if that happens to be around your plants, you know, it's going to disrupt the roots. So I had a couple of uh, raccoon relocated to the forest. and uh, But I noticed today there's digging again. So there's another one. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to have to find another way to do that, though, because that's, um, you know, to trap animals in the city, you've got to have a licensed person that does that. And, right. Um, you can't just do it yourself. Now, in uh, a couple of, well, a couple of videos ago, uh, in this uh, last fall, you went and visited the Heirloom Expo, and, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this, because it's a fascinating expo. I've never been to it. You were there. For people who watch the video of you being there and see photographs in magazines, obviously you can't uh, understand the magnitude of this expo, but what was the biggest thing you took away from the Heirloom Expo that you visited uh, last well, year? Well, the, the day that I was there culminated with Vandana Shiva speaking at night. So everything, sort, you know, everything during the day sort of built up to that. I saw some lectures and this and that and the, the exhibits and the food and the music. It's all wonderful. 
Um, but it built up to the culmination of, of hearing her speak, which is so powerful to hear her speak, especially in person. And um, so the, the thing that I took away from it is there are so many heirloom seed growers and other purveyors, you know, other manufacturers of, of you know, bee equipment and beehive equipment and uh, water filtration. And there's all sorts of other uh, related type products there which you can learn about. Uh, but it, it just felt so wholesome to have all these people, and they've all got kids, so it was a total, you know, a lot of families, a lot of young people, a lot of older people. It was a real, real cross-section of uh, ages, and, uh, and and that was very encouraging to see. And, um, you know, they, they had another one this year, which I didn't get to go to, but I think that if you, there's any way you can go, you really must go, and do a show there, because... Yeah. Um, it's a it's it's a one it's very down to earth. <laughs> I, I, that's really not a pun. It's it's really down to earth, but there's so much to learn there and so much to see. Uh, but I will mention because you said you know what are some of the mistakes. <laughs> I will I will I will uh, let you in on a little tip on on my uh, experience because I shoot everything myself because people say well how can you shoot everything yourself, and I said well I do because you know when. When I need to shoot something, there's not necessarily somebody around who can who has a you know who can manage my camera. So I went to the uh, heirloom expo by myself, intending upon shooting an episode. And I got to Santa Rosa. Now that's an eight-hour drive from Los Angeles, and I had been shooting for about two hours when I realized that my battery was going down. And at that point, I realized I had left my backup battery in Los Angeles oh. on the charger. And um, so here's an opportunity where I could really have been kicking myself, but I just take it as a learning experience. You know, in the two hours that I, I, I shot, I, I got quite a bit of footage. And so it doesn't really tell the whole story. I mean, it's a big story. Uh, there's, there's a huge building at the Expo with nothing but vegetables, with a big mountain, mountain of uh, squashes and pumpkins. And... Um, and I didn't even get in there with my camera, so I, I really encourage everybody who who has an opportunity to go to go. Okay, I appreciate you coming on the program. The website is latebloomershow.com. It just doesn't have videos; it has blog posts and tons and tons of information and resources about urban organic gardening. Uh, I encourage you all to go over there and check it out. The link will be in the show notes. Again, Kay, thank you for coming on the program. Thanks so much, Joey. Thanks for having me. And we'll be back right after this. If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear, penetrating product called Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your bare, untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops, by spraying Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts. Internal Wood Stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCoatings.com. Do you want your next raised beds to be easy, functional, and beautiful? The Embrace helps you create the garden you've always wanted. Finally, raised beds that everyone can assemble and enjoy. No tools needed. Just slide any lumber into the Embrace corner, fill with your favorite soil mix, and you're ready to plant. Made from 100% recycled steel right here in the USA. And a portion of every sale helps to build school and community gardens all across the country. Let the Embrace help you create your next raised bed. Grow beautifully with the Embrace, available at local garden centers and online at artofthegarden.net. This is Jeff Radke from the Lost Skills Podcast. You can listen to me at lostskillspodcast.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast with Holly and Joey Baird. That's a neat little story about how she had her, her neighbors, you know, she had the dead tree in her parkway and how the neighbors came and helped her. And now she's got a little organic urban farm going on there on her property. Welcome back to the program, everybody. If you want to know more about the sponsors you've just heard in our entire sponsor lineup, you can check them out in the show notes of this program. In addition to going to our website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and checking them out, clicking on their icons, and seeing what they have to offer. 
support them because they support us in the same gardening beliefs. We're not done yet. We've got two more topics to cover. We've got gardening in two minutes, and we're going to talk about mulch. Gardening in two minutes is a audio production that Holly and I produce each week for a number of podcasts and a few radio programs. If you want Gardening in Two Minutes on your particular program, you can contact us through the website. This Gardening in Two Minutes is about going to the farmer's market. And this Gardening in Two Minutes is sponsored by Wood Prairie Farms, located in Bridgewater, Maine, focusing on certified seed potatoes. With 26 specialty varieties to pick from, get yours now. Go to woodprairiefarms.com. And here is Gardening in Two Minutes. This is Gardening in Two Minutes. When it comes to growing your own vegetables, we may not all be successful at everything we put in the ground. But what do we do if there's things that we want to eat or can that we just weren't successful at growing? You can go to your local farmer's market. This way you're still getting fresh produce from your area or within your region and you can support your local businesses. Now how can one find whether or not they have a farmer's market and where that farmer's market may be held? The easiest way generally to find a farmer's market is to go to a website which is localharvest.org localharvest.org and you put in your zip code you can also find other things there but you can definitely find farmer's markets or sometimes farmer's markets are put on by your community so you can contact your local city hall or town hall. For most people a farmer's market would consist of vegetables. Is that the case or is there other items that can be purchased? There's always other items. Um, Sometimes there's pre-made food, hot food, cold food. You can also usually find stuff like honey, um, fruits, flowers, pastries, things like that. Now, whenever you go to a farmer's market, uh, you there's different different forms of payments that they will accept, or is it just strictly cash? It's generally just cash. Some farmers markets, if they are selling different things besides the the food, then they will have a lot of those vendors will have a credit card type system. However, if you do have an EBT or a SNAP card or food stamp card, whatever you want to call it. Generally, farmers markets will accept those. You can't just hand it to the farmer themselves. You'll have to get go to the farmers market information table, and they'll take care of it that way. Now, there are multiple different things that the farmer could be selling, and if you're not familiar with those, you can definitely talk to the farmer and ask one how and what practices they use to grow those particular vegetables, fruits, or other items, and how to prepare them. Right. The farmers are very informative. They're glad to help you out. I would suggest, however, going, you know, maybe when it's not as busy, if you can, if you need a lot of information. If you just need a quick tip, then it's okay. For more information about Farmer's Markets, our weekly video production, as well as our free downloadable digital quarterly magazine, you can find all that information at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. For Gardening in Two Minutes, I'm Joy Baird. And I'm Holly Baird. So go to the Farmer's Market to buy what you can't grow or you don't have space for. We're going to talk about mulch before we wrap the show up. Mulch is a very important part of gardening, whether you have traditional ground garden, raised beds, or even containers. Right. So mulch is important because it does a few things. It can prevent the soil from splashing up onto your plants, which makes it susceptible to diseases. Um, It also helps hold in the moisture to your plants. And if you have uh, containers, you can mulch in your containers to keep the moisture in and have you water them less. And mulch can also uh, lessen the actual ambient uh, soil temperature by up to 5 degrees if you're in a very, very hot climate. Cover the, the top of the soil and you can also get that soil a little cooler for your roots. Let's talk about real quickly before we wrap the show up some of the some of the mulch that you is recommended to use and, and some you kinda want to shy away from. Right, so a good one and you may have a, a a large amount of this is grass clippings. But before you just go ahead and toss your grass clippings on to your plants or on your plants, what you want to do is you want to maybe spread them in your driveway, let them dry out a little bit so that they're a little bit more crunchier and drier. Or you can just blow them out on the grass, the lawn, and then rake them up when you're that, ready to use. That too. Um, that way you can make sure they're drier and ready to use for your, around your plants. You can also use shredded paper. Now that's a controversial one because of the, the ink and, and uh, the soy-based ink and all that. That's one. We've used that. Relatively worked decent. You know, we had a lot of shredded paper. Uh, we mainly take the shredded paper and incorporate it in that compost bin and just use it that way. Uh, you can use, if you have uh, dry um, uh, fall leaves, if you still have an abundance of fall leaves that you've 
uh, begin to uh, pile up in a corner somewhere. That really works well. And then as it breaks down, it, it works that nutrients that's in the leaves into the, into the soil. Wood chips can be used as a top dressing. Now, you don't want to dig the wood chips in because the wood chips, as they break down, will begin to rob the soil of nitrogen, which is one of the key building blocks of uh, the plant growth. So that's one thing you kind of want to... We use wood chippings and sawdust as walk paths underneath, uh, mm-hmm. uh, on top of the walk paths there in our weedless type of uh, raised burn garden. Uh, there's some other... Uh, what's some other ones? You, you want to really shy away from anything that's synthetic or anything that has a fragrance to it, such as like uh, cocoa mulch. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, that's not good either. So just kind of think about what you could possibly use and how you want to use it. In your garden. And, and the key thing with the mulch is whatever method you go with, the key here is one, weed suppression. This will help take some of the weeds out because you're uh, uh, avoiding them of light. And it also helps retain the moisture that you have in your garden. Now, uh, one of our friends, uh, Sean Studer, he is a big advocate of mulching and leaving natural materials alone. Uh, he'll be on the program in a couple of weeks because in nature... Everything in nature, there's something that's covering the ground, whether it's grass, leaves. The only time you don't see something being covered is in a desert area. So I think that's something maybe we should mimic nature a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Straw is also another good mulch. You want to avoid hay because hay contains a lot of grass seeds. Well, that will just about do it for this week's program. We greatly appreciate you tuning in, staying with us, joining us on our gardening journey, and helping you be a better gardener. You want to know more or have any questions and want to contact us or just tell us, hey, you know, we appreciate what you're doing. You can always go to the website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and click on that contact button and drop us a line and tell us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what you'd like to hear more of. The audio that you've heard in the program, the music is courtesy of free sfx.co.uk and audionutronics.com, two free services with copyright free and royalty free audio we use to help liven up the podcast. And two of the other audio in the ads come from paradigmgardens.com and also by nessalakombucha.com and that's owned by them. So until next time, we will I'm Joy Baird. I'm Holly Baird. And we will see you in the garden. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide and distributed in association with WI Garden Media.